Hello and welcome to Fluid Mechanics. My name is Dr. Mark Taylor, lecturer in civil engineering. So this is unit five and in this unit we're going to look at one dimensional flow. So we're in the fifth unit of the module and when we look at one dimensional flow we're going to consider the conservation of energy and momentum. So during this session I aim to explain the application of Newton's laws of motion with recognition of the special properties of fluids. We're going to understand the importance of momentum and energy equations. We're going to appreciate the conservation of mass and energy. We're going to apply and use the momentum and energy equations. And then we're going to look at Bernoulli's equation and its use in some common fluid mechanics problems. So at the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand the application of Newton's laws to fluids, demonstrate understanding of momentum in fluids, describe the use of the continuity equation and identify how the continuity equation can be applied and also you should be able to explain how Bernoulli's equation can be applied to fluid mechanics problems. So generally fluid flow is three-dimensional but in order to examine fluid flow we often simplify this and we consider it as one-dimensional. So for example if we consider the flow in a tube if it's studied in terms of its mean velocity and then this is a one-dimensional flow. So this unit examines the methods and solutions to such cases. And what we're going to do is study flow as one-dimensional flow. And we're going to use the continuity equation, Bernoulli's equation, and the momentum equation. So let's start by looking at the conservation of energy in fluid flow. So let's consider a roller coaster. In fact, let's have a look at the one at Porta Ventura that I went on a few years back. So the speed of the roller coaster decreases when it's at the top of the steep slope and then it increases towards the bottom. This is because the potential energy increases and the kinetic energy decreases at the top and the opposite occurs at the bottom. Ignoring frictional losses, the sum of the two forms of energy is constant at any height. And this is a manifestation of the principle of conservation of energy. The figure A and B on the right shows the relationship between potential energy of the water at its level and its kinetic energy, that is the speed at which the water gushes from the hose. A fluid can attain a large kinetic energy when it's under pressure, as shown in figure C. A hydraulic press is powered by the forces and energy due to such pressure. In fluids, these three forms of energy are exchangeable. And again, ignoring any frictional losses, the total energy is constant. And this is an expression of the law of conservation of energy and can be applied to fluids and is known as Bernoulli's theorem. So let's now look at force and momentum. So the momentum of a particle or object is defined as the product of its mass and velocity. A particle in a fluid stream will possess momentum and where the magnitude or direction of the velocity changes there will be a corresponding change in momentum. So according to Newton's second law a force is required to produce this change. This force may be provided by contact with a solid boundary, that is the impeller of a pump or the wall of a pipe. So according to Newton's third law, the fluid will exert an equal and opposite force on the solid boundary. And these forces are known as dynamic forces since they arise from the motion of the fluid and are additional to the static forces due to the pressure of the fluid. So if we consider the control volume shown below, the continuity of mass flow can be expressed as the density multiplied by the area multiplied by the velocity at point one equals the density and area and velocity at point two equals the mass flow rate of the water. So the rate of change across the control volume is calculated from the mass flow equation. So note that this is an increase in momentum per unit time in the direction of motion and according to Newton's second law is caused by a force. This is the resultant force acting on the fluid element in the direction of motion. And remember, according to Newton's third law, there will be an equal and opposite reaction on its surroundings. So although this lecture is about one dimensional flow, it's important I explain the concept of multi-dimensional flow. And I'm going to do that in the following slide. So if we consider the forces in multi-dimensional flow, we can see we can have an x, y and z component of that force. 
and the resultant component force acting on a free body of fluid is equal to the difference between the momentum components at the entry and exit sections. If we consider only two-dimensional flow, then we have an x and y component of that force, and we can calculate the resultant force as shown here. So in two-dimensional flow along a streamline, the total force exerted on the fluid in a given control volume is equal to the rate of change of momentum in the given direction of the fluid passing through the control volume. And this force F is made up of three components. Firstly, the force exerted by a solid body or boundary of control volume. Second, the force exerted by gravity. And third, the force, force exerted by fluid outside the control volume. So when we do calculations, it's important to follow a standard procedure. And in this case, the steps are going to include, we draw a control volume. We start with an Audi sketch. We decide on the coordinate axis system we're going to use. We then calculate the total force, calculate the total pressure, and calculate the body force, and then calculate the resultant force. And if you apply these logical steps to your calculations, it will ensure that you keep them organised and structured. So let's now look at an example. What we're going to look at here is a stream of water or a jet striking a flat plate. So let's consider the force exerted by a jet striking a flat plate as shown in the diagram. First of all, we calculate the total force. And as the system is symmetrical, the forces in the y direction cancel. So they're going to equal zero. Now, we need to also calculate the pressure force, but the pressure force is zero as the inlet and outlets are at atmospheric pressure. We calculate the body force, but the control volume is small, so we can ignore the body force due to gravity. So we can calculate the resultant force, but note that F subscript PX and F subscript BX are equal to zero. Therefore, the force exerted on the fluid is the force on the plate which is the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. So we can calculate the mass flow entering the control volume, but note that the plate is stationary. The rate of change of momentum normal to the plate surface can be calculated as the rate of change of momentum with respect to time, as shown. So what I've done here is I've calculated the uh, change in the force based on the angle of the plate. And as we can see, if the plate is vertical, the force is at its maximum. And as we turn the plate through to 90 degrees, you'll see that the force on the plate is zero. The force being zero because the water is just literally skipping off the surface of the plate. So let's now have a look at some forces on a pipe bend. So let's consider a pipe bend with a constant cross section lying in the horizontal plane and turning through an angle of theta degrees. So why would we want to know the forces? Well, with the change in direction, a force will act on the bend. And we need to resist this force by providing a thrust block. And this is so that, for example, this pipe doesn't move in the ground and then rupture the joints between the two sections of pipe. So here you can see our control volume in the red dotted box. But note the coordinate axis system. It's important to choose the axis so that one axis is pointing in the direction of the inlet velocity as shown here in the diagram. So now we need to calculate the total forces, first of all in the x direction and then in the y direction. But note that the velocity component in the y direction at point one is equal to zero. So we then need to calculate the pressure force which is equal to the pressure force at point one minus the pressure force at point two. Finally, the body force. There are no body forces in the x or y directions. The only body force is that exerted by gravity. And we're going to ignore gravity in this example as it acts into the direction of the paper. So we then need to calculate the resultant force. And the resultant force on the fluid is given by the square root of FRx squared minus FRy squared and the direction of the application is equal to tan, the inverse of tan, multiplied by f or y divided 
divided by FRx. So the force on the bend is in the same magnitude, but it's in the opposite direction. So let's now consider the force on a curved vein, and this might be an impeller of a pump or a vein in a turbine, for example. So here we can see a diagram showing the curved vein and V1 in the velocity as we approach the vein. The vein is at an angle of theta, in this case 60 degrees. You can see our control volume and we can see our axis and also our velocity as we exit the vein. So if we neglect the force of gravity and assume that the free jet is in atmospheric pressure conditions, we can calculate Rx and Ry. And since the nozzle and the vein are fixed relative to each other, the mass per unit time entering the control volume equals the mass per unit time leaving the nozzle or the vein in this case. So we can calculate Rx in the x direction and in Ry in the y direction. We can then combine the components and the resultant force exerted by the fluid on the curved vein is R, as calculated as shown. And the angle of inclination is also calculated as shown below. So now we're going to have a look at continuity. So in steady flow, the mass per unit of time passing through each section is constant despite changes in the pipe diameter. And this is the law of conservation of mass. If we consider the pipe shown below, the diameter decreases between sections 1 and 2, having cross-sectional areas A1 and A2, at which point the mean velocities are V1 and V2. So rho multiplied by the area times the velocity is a constant, and if the fluid is incompressible, then the density will be constant. Therefore, the area times the velocity will also be a constant. So rho AV is the mass of fluid passing per unit of time, and it's known as the mass flow rate. The area times the volume is known as the volumetric flow rate, and this is constant in an incompressible fluid. So now we're going to have a look at the work of Bernoulli and his equation. So Bernoulli was born in January 1700 and died in March 1782. He was a Swiss mathematician, but was born in Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. Bernoulli's principle states that an increase in the speed of a fluid occurs simultaneously with a decrease in pressure, or a decrease in the fluid's potential energy. He put forward the name hydrodynamics to describe water flow. The total energy equation was his contribution, and the principle is named after Daniel Bernoulli, who published it in his book Hydrodynamica in 1738. He considered the properties of basic importance in fluid flow, particularly pressure, density and velocity, and set forth their fundamental relationship. So Bernoulli's equation, quite simply, is the pressure energy per unit weight, or the pressure head, plus the kinetic energy per unit weight, the velocity head, plus the potential energy per unit weight, or the potential head, equals the total head, or the total energy per unit weight. The figure here shows the energy changes in a fluid system. The solid line at the bottom is the datum, and we can see at position 1, we've got the potential head, Z1, then the pressure head, P1 over rho G, and then the velocity head, V1 squared over 2G. And we can see how this varies through the system by looking at the total energy line and the hydraulic gradient line. So one of the best ways to understand Bernoulli's equation is to apply it to some practical fluid mechanics problems. And we're going to do that in the next couple of slides. So let's now consider a small orifice discharge. So we've got our orifice, or our opening or hole on the side of the tank, with the fluid discharging as a jet into the atmosphere. The volume rate of flow depends upon the head of fluid above the orifice. The term small infers an orifice which has a diameter which is small compared to the head producing the flow, so the head loss does not really vary. The figure shown shows a small orifice in the side of a large tank. The surface of the water at point A is at atmospheric pressure, where VA is negligible as the tank is large. At point B, the pressure again will be atmospheric, and the velocity VB will be that of the jet V. 
So taking the datum for potential energy as the centre of the orifice and applying Bernoulli's equation at points A and B, we get the total energy per unit weight at position A equals the total energy per unit weight at position B. Now ZA minus ZB equals H, VA equals zero, VB equals V, and the pressure at point A, PA, equals the pressure at point B. So the velocity of the jet is equal to the square root of 2GH. And this is a statement of Torricelli's theorem. That is, the velocity of the issuing jet is proportional to the square root of the head producing the flow. So if A is a cross-sectional area of the orifice, the discharge Q is A multiplied by the square root of 2GH. So the actual discharge is considerably less than the theoretical discharge. Therefore, it must be modified using a coefficient of discharge as shown. There are two reasons for the difference. The first one being the velocity of the jet is less than that calculated previously and there's a loss of energy between points A and B. So the velocity actual must be modified by the coefficient of velocity, which is determined experimentally and is approximately 0.97. So the paths of the fluid particles converge in the orifice. The area of the jet is less than the orifice. The particles have a component of velocity towards the centre of the pressure at point C and is greater than atmospheric. It's only at point B where the paths of the particles become parallel and the section through B is called the vena contractor. And the actual area of the jet at point B is multiplied by the coefficient of contraction. And this is determined experimentally and will depend upon the profile of the orifice. So with the coefficients now, we can now calculate the actual discharge. The relationship between the coefficients is the coefficient of discharge is equal to the coefficient of contraction multiplied by the coefficient of velocity. The values of the coefficients are determined experimentally and values for standard configurations are available in British standards. So we can calculate the coefficients by measuring, for example, in the case of the coefficient of discharge, the volume discharge in a given time and comparing it with the theoretical discharge. For the area of the jet at the vena contractor, we can consider the area of the jet at the vena contractor divided by the area of the orifice. The actual velocity of the jet at the vena contractor can also be measured and that's the ratio of the velocity of the vena contractor divided by the velocity, which is theoretical. So why is this theory important? Well, what we can do is we can apply this to calculate the volumetric flow rate. So we can create measurement devices such as a Venturi meter on the left or an orifice plate meter on the right, where we measure the pressure differential and from that we can calculate the volumetric flow rate passing through the pipe. So we now know how we can apply Newton's laws of motion to fluids. We have an understanding of the importance of momentum and energy equations, and we can now appreciate the conservation of mass and energy. We know about Bernoulli's equation now, and we know how we can apply that and use it in practical fluid mechanics problems. And the tutorial questions are going to help you explore the application of Bernoulli's equation to practical problems in fluid mechanics. So we've now got some tutorial questions we can tackle and that'll be the end of unit five. The next unit, we're going to look at flow in pipes, parallel pipes, branching pipes. We're going to look at friction and head loss. So thanks for listening. Bye for now.